That's what Easter's about. It's about the one who came to live in our broken and fallen world. And, you know, this morning we celebrate the resurrection. And it is a fantastic climax to what Jesus' life on earth was about. But, you know, he didn't make everything perfect overnight. He arose from the dead in a lonely, empty tomb. And he was greeted by people he didn't recognize him. He came back with holes in his hand and a scar in his side. And that same risen Jesus meets us in our broken worlds today. We're not in heaven yet. That's our destiny. That's where God will take us. But even in his resurrection, Jesus somehow meets us in our brokenness, in our pain, and in our hurt, and in that mess of falling plates, which is what life is. I don't know about your life, but sometimes I feel that's my life. Mess of falling plates. But God comes into that reality. And that's what the resurrection is about. That somehow the life of God penetrates into our broken existence and joins us to him. It's the best news we could possibly ever have. And I want to focus on the resurrection, particularly from the perspective of of what it means for us to be forgiven. And how much the resurrection is that guarantee of your forgiveness. Now you heard in the reading before, Paul says, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, then you are still in your sins. Good Friday is great. Jesus died for us. But death without resurrection is meaningless. Because everyone dies. But somehow Jesus' death was different because he took all that death is about and he buried it in himself and death couldn't hold him. Hallelujah. And his resurrection is the guarantee that everything that creates death in you and me is buried and gone forever. And we can face the future with confidence. Now, in in 1982, I was studying at Bradford University, and I had a friend called Carol. And we were a bit mischievous together, if we put it like this. We used to try and play tricks on people. And we had a friend called Chris, who was studying civil engineering, was out on his year's program. So I wrote to him and told him that me and Carol had got married. Now, I think the funny thing is that he believed it. Obviously, there was something more than just good friends going on there that we thought. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, We told him we got married. He came rushing up to Bradford where we were studying to congratulate us. And when he gets there, the fact that I'm living in student halls and she's in a student house somewhere else, the fact that I'm in my final year studying for my final exams, the fact that there's no photos anywhere of the wedding, the fact there's no ring on my finger, the fact that none of my friends know anything about it, none of this made any difference to him because he had believed that we were married. I didn't expect him to come rushing up with a wedding present. Well, actually, there was no present. He said he was too poor. But anyway, he did come rushing up. And I had to sit him down in my room and I said, Chris, we're not married. And I still remember the look on his face. You're not married. Not married. You and Carol, not married. Not married. And this sort of look of just utter disbelief. Now, I think something of that is what the disciples must have felt the morning of the resurrection that multiplied a hundredfold. It's so easy for us because we've been brought up on the story of Jesus and we all know Jesus dies, but Jesus is raised from the dead. And that's become part of us that we fail to appreciate the impact and the power of that resurrection. Some of you may know this film. You know Tom Hanks? Cast Away, great film. I thought um, that the guy sitting next to the fire should have got an Oscar Wilson. I thought he did a, had a great role there. Wonderful. Wasn't it sad when he fell into the sea at the end? I know, Wilson, Wilson, so sad. But if you remember the scene where Cast Away Tom Hanks is restored to civilization and where he meets his wife again, and she comes in with her new husband, and the look on her face, she's just, she, I, I'm sorry. We all thought you were dead. I mean, it's been three years, you know. And that look of horror and disbelief and shock that something which you had accepted as true, the death of your husband in her case, three years later, suddenly that's all turned around. That's what happened on the morning of the resurrection. Utter disbelief for some of them. It's very easy for us to criticize the disciples. You know, when the women come running back and say, we've gone there, we can't find him. I don't know where they put him. What's going on? And the disciples didn't know what to do with that. They didn't believe the women. It's not just because they were women, though that probably had something to do with it. (laughs) But it was the fact that they had seen Jesus crucified. 
if any of you have seen Mel Gibson's The Passion film, you'll see the brutality of all that. And some of these theories that people had, well, Jesus just fainted on the cross. They didn't realize that he wasn't dead. They put him in the tomb. It was a bit cold, so that revived him. So he pushed the stone out of the way, fought the guards off, and came and said, hello, I'm alive. I mean, totally unrealistic. They had seen him crucified. They'd watched his life ever away. They'd taken a limp and broken body and they'd laid it in a tomb, sealed up. The last thing they were expecting, despite all that Jesus said, was that he was going to be raised from the dead that morning. The impact of it was huge for them. And we have to allow some of that impact to affect us in the same way like that. Now, I've got some photos of some places here. I don't know if any of you know where any of them are. This is the shrine of Baha'u'llah the founder of the Baha'i faith. This one? This one's a nice one, this one. This is the Temple of the Tooth in Sri Lanka. The Buddha, when he died, he was cremated, and his ashes and his teeth were given out and put into different monuments around the place. And here in Sri Lanka, they have the Temple of the Tooth. It's the nearest to get to his burial place. They're like this. This one. How's he Chinese, Ken? Confucius, he say, you need to do more Chinese lessons. This is Confucius's tomb. He's buried in southern China in a cemetery with 100,000 of his direct descendants. This one, anyone been on the Holy Land tour? This is the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron, where it's said that uh, Abraham's cave, where he buried his wife, and then later where he was buried, that's where the Jewish patriarchs are buried. This one is in Kartapur in northeast India, on the border, northwest India, on the border of Pakistan. It's where Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism, is buried. This one. It's the Mosque of the Green Dome in Medina, in Saudi Arabia, where Muhammad is buried. This one. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, where Jesus spent one and a half days. All the others, there's something still there. Christianity didn't want to be any less than all these religions which have a monument to where their founder is buried. So we built a church on where Jesus spent a couple of nights depending on how you read the scriptures. Good Friday to a resurrection sometime on Sunday morning. Don't know how we can't get three nights out of that. I personally think Jesus was probably crucified on a Wednesday. Ask me about that later if you're interested. But anyway, it's a detail. He spent at most 72 hours in this place and then was gone. There is no monument, burial place to the founder of Christianity because this is the testimony that we have. And that's what must mark our faith more than anything else. More even, I would say, than the cross. Because the cross was the place where Jesus died, but it was not the end of his life on earth. Jesus came through an empty tomb. And that is what marks our, our faith. A place in time and in space where the Son of God, who became human, who had lived a perfect life as we've seen, and who offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for you and for me, where he came back to life in a demonstration that sin has no more power over those of us that choose to ally our lives with him. The empty tomb is our monument more than anything else. It's much harder to put an empty tomb on a necklace around your neck. I know it's easy to put a cross, but I think we really should have something more like that. And as I say, I'd like to focus on just on this one aspect because you know every Easter we, we go through, we think again about the resurrection, but I'd like you to go away from here today with that absolute bedrock certainty in your life, that whatever it is that in any way separated you from God, that has gone. And that you are accepted, that you are forgiven, that your life is clean, that you are one with God. And to be able to walk away from the stuff and the muck in your life that brings condemnation and guilt and pain to you, and say, all that was buried in the cross of Christ. And in his resurrection, I am set free from all that. Now, all through Jesus' life, he, he seemed able to live in the knowledge of what was to come. He offered forgiveness, even though that forgiveness would only be given to people on the basis of his death and his resurrection. And yet, as he walked through life, he was able to say to people, you will be forgiven. There's some fantastic incidents that, that, that speak to us about that. The resurrection more than anything else, marks him out, Paul says in Romans, um, that it was his resurrection through the power of the Holy Spirit which appointed him as the Son of God. I know Jesus was always the Son of God. I'm not questioning that kind of relationship. But his resurrection from the dead 
gave him that special place as the one who conquered all this and takes his place as the one who's been into death and come out from that. So I want to take you through around a, a, a few scriptures that, that look at this. Some that Jesus himself said, some of a perspective from beyond that. And the important thing in this really, is like what Ross was saying on, on Good Friday, it's not just about the event itself. It's about the interpretation of that. Ross mentioned that the, the New Testament gives very little detail about the crucifixion. The bare bones. He was crucified a little more. We go back into Isaiah 53, which starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13, by the way. Someone, when they put the chapter divisions on their horse, I think they put it in the wrong place. So whenever you read Isaiah 53, make sure you start in chapter 52, verse 13, to get the full poem um, right from the beginning. But that is the, the commentary, if you like, and gives the meaning of what Good Friday is about, him suffering for us. And it was after the resurrection that the disciples were able to look back and say, this is what resurrection is about. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Do any of you remember It's a Knockout? When that was on? Well, the, the town we lived in, Spain, nearby, there was a, a swimming pool we used to go to in the summer months. A little place called La Puebla de Sancho Pérez. And they had this swimming pool, an open air swimming pool. And one day in the summer, they had a, a sort of game, for, mostly for kids or older kids. It was mainly the sort of the 20 year old guys wanted to impress the girls that tried it, which was a big telegraph pole covered with grease and soap with a prize at the end. And it extended over the top of the swimming pool, and the guys, well, had to sort of try and get to the end. Imagine this scene, trying to hold on to this pole. And what happens? They get like three feet up and whoosh, like this. You cannot keep a hold on a greasy pole. That's what the Bible says about death and Jesus. Death could not keep its hold on him. He goes down into death. And imagine those three days, death trying to cling on to Jesus like a greasy pole. Stay here. And he can't. Because death has no power, no hold over Jesus. Death has power where there is sin. And as Jesus had no sin, then death could not keep its hold on him. Peter goes on to say, to quote from Psalm 16, says, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. We all know what death is about, isn't it? It's about a body which loses life and then starts to decay. Jesus' body did not decay. And then Peter goes on to say in his sermon at the end of this, at the end of this here, God has raised Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of this. The disciples' life was revolutionized because they had seen that death could not hold the Lord Jesus. It's very different to hearing it. He told them several times, I will be raised. But now they see it and they experience it. They touch him, touch him. As Thomas says, unless I see with my own eyes, unless I put my fingers in the holes in his hands, bit gory, isn't it? Unless I do that, I won't believe. So Jesus says, okay, try it. There you are. It fits. Go on, do it. The impact of that on Thomas's life as he sees that. Another one from the Psalms which looks towards this. This is what Jesus' resurrection is about. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is it from east to west? And don't say the earth's a circle if you go round far enough they touch each other. Okay, we'll go across the universe. And no fear is about the universe being able to go round and come back again, Tim. Okay, keep your physics for later. I don't think they thought about it. East to west, boom, diametric opposites. Where are your sins when you believe in Jesus? Where are they? They're not where you are. They are separated from you as the east is from the west. That's what the resurrection is about because he takes your sin, he puts it into death, and he comes up to give you life. And your sin is there in that grave, separated from you because as you believe in Christ, you are never going to that place of death. Another one, I love this one, Micah. Micah's name means who is like God. And he says, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. Now about this. You will tread our sins underfoot. That's what he does on the cross. And hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. The Mariana Trench. All 11,000 meters of it. 
go over the Philippines. Down, and a big sign in case anyone's tempted, no fishing. Okay? That's where they all are. The sea and water is often used as an image of death. And that is what Christ has done with your sin. He's taken it into his death and he's left it there when he comes up out of life like that. As I say, Jesus lived all of his life in the knowledge that his resurrection would guarantee our forgiveness. So different times through his ministry, you see how he, how he comes to people and on the basis of their faith, he assures them that their sin is forgiven. This one, we had Roy the other week with his hats on, didn't we, doing the, the builder and the tiles. This is where they let the man down through the roof. And in front of all the Pharisees, Jesus turns to this man and says, your sins are forgiven. Jesus could say that because he knew where he was taking that man's sins. And he knew he would walk away, leaving them behind. In the Lord's Supper, what we celebrate, these words that Jesus himself uses, is this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And he knows that it's for the forgiveness of sins because he will leave all that behind in the grave as he moves on into eternity, having left death behind. Later in Luke, it's fascinating the story as you read the disciples' interaction with Jesus after his resurrection. You have the two disciples on the Emmaus Road who don't recognize Jesus, and then when he meets with them, trying to help them understand about this. When Jesus is being crucified, that very moment, while he's there on the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Somehow there's that realization that even in that moment, as he's carrying all this, he's able to say and ask for forgiveness for those around him, knowing that what he's going through is the guarantee of their forgiveness. And while he's there, a few lines later in the Gospel of Luke, he has these two criminals, one on either side and one who hurls insults, the other who understands that maybe there's a, another way to approach this. And so that man says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus knows what's going on. He knows that his death is putting an end to sin, but it's not just about death. He says to this man, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. I don't know how that other guy would have received that, what that would have meant to him. But just hear what Jesus is saying. Death is not the end. He's going to go through that death and come through to a different place. And those who place their faith in him leave everything behind and join him there in that place. This is a passage from up the um, Emmaus Road where Jesus is trying to explain again to his disciples and give them that ability really to assimilate what's going on in this. And he says, explain what the Old Testament says. This is what's written. The Messiah will suffer he will rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Forgiveness is somehow rooted in to all that Jesus did in his death and in his resurrection. And perhaps one of the most graphic, certainly for me, in an understanding of the outworking of this. Because sometimes theology can be a bit dry, can't it? You know, our faith can be a bit intellectual. We believe that Jesus died. It's all a bit of a something going on in here, but try and put yourself in the place of Peter in this incident. Peter, you'll know, before Jesus was crucified, Jesus told him, really, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, no, 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 not me. Says, but you are, you are, just accept it. No, not me. All the disciples said the same, but Peter's there. I'm not going to deny you. There comes that moment of the trial. Jesus is before the, the Sanhedrin there. And Peter does deny Jesus three times. Jesus looks at Peter. Something goes deep into Peter's life as if he realizes. He goes out and weeps bitterly. Now, I don't know if they ever talked about it. I suspect not. I think it's sometimes like parenting. There's times when you know, and they know, and you know they know, and they know you know they know. And you don't actually need to say anything else. You just sort of look and say, uh-huh, they go, uh-huh. And it's sort of left there like that, isn't it? Well, I think there's something of that going on here with Peter and with Jesus. Because you don't hear Peter say, I'm really sorry, I messed up, shouldn't have done that. You don't hear that going on. But Peter comes to Jesus and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter, summoning up all his might, says, you know I love you. <laughs> and Jesus just says, feed my lambs. 
Three times this goes through, and there's another dynamic going on that I won't go into for today, but Jesus coming to Peter. And I think that must have brought to Peter such a tremendous understanding of forgiveness. I denied Jesus in the moment where he needed me most. A show of bravado, get a sword out, chop an ear off, and then run away and hide and deny him to his face. The feeling of failure that ran through Peter. And yet in that moment, as Jesus restores him there, I think that absolute certainty of forgiveness will have gone deep, deep, deep into his heart and into his life. And I think that's what God would like each one of us to have. Somehow in that intimacy of knowing that in Christ's resurrection, anything and everything that in any way could put a barrier between me and God is gone. Now I don't know what you build your walls out of your walls between you and God. For some it's failure, for some it's rejection, for some it's anger, hatred, for some it's bitterness. I don't know what your walls are built of. But what I would like you to know is that wall is demolished in Christ and your forgiveness is assured by the resurrection. So take the hand of the risen Lord Jesus and allow that certainty of his triumph over death to dispel all of these things and to change the way you relate to yourself and to this wall which has been there between you and him. And allow that, that the shock of Resurrection Sunday to smash all that to bits and to create a new way of relating with God. Where no longer is it about, oh, I've done this, I've done the other, and I've failed, and there's this, and that. This heap of stuff which we bring time and time and again. But to come back to that place of saying, all of that, was buried with Christ on a Friday, and hallelujah, resurrection life means I can live in freedom from that. And I can look God in the face and say, thank you, you love me. I am accepted. I am forgiven. That is absolutely fantastic. And that's what we need to take away from Easter. The certainty of a clear, new relationship with God. Now, when you've got that in place, that's where you can start to live in the same way towards other people. Because other people are going to mess you up. They're going to let you down. They're going to fail you. They're going to hurt you, sometimes deliberately. And yet Christ calls us, as Paul says in Colossians, bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, just in case, sure you haven't, but just in case, forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In Christ's resurrection, your forgiveness is guaranteed. And in Christ's resurrection, he gives you power to live not just as one who is forgiven, but one who can choose to forgive as you yourself has been forgiven. So as we celebrate Easter Sunday and this fantastic resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, embrace him, the one who puts everything into death and walks into life. Allow him to give you that new perspective on yourself and the way you relate to him, and allow him to transform the way you relate to others, and that resurrection power is in the beauty.